we talk about uh, accessibility issues or disability issues or access to the web, um, we all remember that there's essentially four sort of basic accessibility barriers that may exist. Um, the one that most people uh, instantly sort of understand is visual impairment, and that ranges from total blindness to low vision and other visual impairments. Um, I've been working, as Denis mentioned, very actively uh, looking at media, and so auditory impairments is an issue that we need to, need to be aware of. Anytime we use any kind of sound in a web uh, document or a web application, we need to ensure that information is not just provided by sound. Of course, mobility impairment is a big issue as well. Um, interestingly enough, that one's actually coming to the fore more and more as we start moving into mobile devices. Um, where we're not using a mouse and whatnot. So we have to rethink about these things as well. And finally, of course, there's the issue of cognitive impairment or cognitive disabilities. And so I think for the most part, many of you in the room are aware of these things. I wanted to get it out front because a lot of what I'm gonna be talking today will sort of be focused mostly on visual impairment issues. Um, there are some issues that will sort of have relations to some of these other disabilities. Um, but I think we pretty much understand that while we have to be aware of all of these things, the visual impairment has a very significant impact on the web because the web is such a visual medium. Of course, various degrees thereof. So one of the things that a lot of people don't really realize, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, is something called the Accessibility API. And what the Accessibility API is, and there's actually a number of different Accessibility APIs, is actually um, the interface with which web pages and the web browser actually interacts with the computer platform. And so it's much deeper down sort of in the stack. And this is really important to remember because the adaptive technology screen readers for the most part aren't directly interacting with the browser, but they're actually working through the accessibility API. And where this is important will become increasingly clear, but I wanted to make sure that people understood that this was an important part of the larger ecosystem that we're talking about. And so, as Michael mentioned, we've got something called ARIA, the Accessible Rich Internet Application. And it's a suite of tools that allows us to expose uh, roles, states, and properties. And what it does is it's exposing those roles, states, and properties to the Accessibility API. And so it says to the Accessibility API, for example, this is a button. And this is the state of the button. The button is pressed. The button is unpressed. And it can tell us what the button does. And so it's very sort of basic contextual information about various widgets. And not only does it represent uh, widgets on a web page, but it also represents, or the Accessibility API also reports things like buttons in your Microsoft Office suite or in your mail client or what have you. So um, we needed a means to be able to convey that information in the web page. We have a, a, a currently a fairly robust amount of support in the adaptive technology tools that are out there, JAWS, Window Eyes, NVDA, VoiceOver, all of these screen reading technologies have very good support for ARIA. ARIA as a technology, as, a, as an, a means to convey this information is now being deeply embedded into many of the uh, JavaScript libraries, jQuery, YUI3, Dojo, these are all JavaScript interface libraries that allow us to put widgets and sliders and those types of things into our web pages. And so there's been a lot of work over the past couple of years to integrate ARIA into these libraries. And if you want more information, there's the URL there, and this is a, a web-based application. I'll put the link up at the end of the presentation. There's also a really useful document on the authoring practices that's very useful for content authors, so I'll point those out as resources. But I thought I'd spend a little bit of time looking at what ARIA really is and how it actually has impact to web developers in the audience today. So the basic um, way that, one of the most basic ways that you can start integrating ARIA into your work is by using the role attribute. And so there's a number of landmark roles in ARIA that basically says, where am I, right? So you can, for example, convey to the uh, uh, API that this is a, a web application, or that this particular section of the web page is a banner, or this information is complementary to the main information on the web page, uh, 
or this is content information. Um, this is primarily used when you're doing interactive uh, aspects. This is a form on the web page or this is the main content on the document, this is the stuff that you came to this web page for, or this is the navigation region. So we have a means now of conveying sort of a structural outline, not only of uh, the document, but sort of um, the, all of the various landmarks. So now we have a real rich framework of understanding the physical layout, the graphical layout, and it's being conveyed back to the APIs so that a non-sighted user understands that this particular div, for example, is the navigation div that is, contains all the navigation controls. We also have one for search. And so all of these roles, again, are very well supported in all of the major screen reading technologies, which again is very, very useful because now we can let uh, screen reader users know exactly where they are on the page with something more useful than this is a div. So um, we also have a way of conveying some of the document structure. And so unlike just sort of the landmarks, there's also some structural elements inside of a document that um, recur time and time again. So for example, this is an article. And a web page could have, say for example, a blog, could have multiple articles on the same page. This is an article, this is an article, this is an article. But there's a conceptual idea that these articles are separate. We can have a column header. So again, we have a graphical layout where we have multiple columns. We can say that this is in fact a heading to that particular column. Or this is a directory. This is a document. So you saw earlier that I could say that there was an application. And so when you have an application, one of the things that we can do by conveying to the accessibility API that this is an application is we can give back some of the keyboard controls. Non-sighted users are always interacting with their uh, keyboard so that they can actually interact with the content. And an application, sometimes they need to have, um, you know, more sort of native or robust application controls as opposed to some more navigational type of role. So if you're going to have an application, you also need to be able to say, no, this is a document. And so it's about giving the control of the keyboard to the various ways of interaction. Math is useful. We've got MathML now that is emerging as a robust standard, a means of marking up mathematical equations. So we can say this particular region is a math block so that, you know, the technology, because MathML, although it's a robust application and a robust standard, still requires some helper applications to interpret. This is a note. This is a presentation. So again, these are not landmarks, but they're conceptual ideas of, of how we may be structuring a document. And there's 11 others that I'm not going to get into. Suffice to say that we have a really rich and robust tool set. I brought up these because these are the ones that are most likely going to be something that I'm going to be encouraging you to use. So we also have 34 different types of widget roles. So I mentioned two or three slides back that we have very robust support in the various JavaScript uh, UI libraries. This is a, a slider control, this is a progress meter, those kinds of things. And so you want to be able to convey to the end user that this div here is in fact a slider. And not only do we say that this is a slider, but this slider is at 30%. This is a volume slider that's at 30%. Or this slider adjusts the base, and this slider adjusts the treble. So we want to be able to convey all of that, and ARIA gives us the, the means of doing it. We're not going to talk about JavaScript today, so most of the widget rules belong in the JavaScript toolbox. If you are a JavaScript developer, if you're interested in developing, native JavaScript, or if you're looking to build uh, modular plugins, say you, you want to build something for jQuery, then you should get into this stuff as well, and we can talk about it uh, later on today in the lobby or something, just grab me. So why am I talking all about all of this? Well, as Michael mentioned earlier, ARIA is now officially part of HTML5. And, and this is really important. This is actually <laughs> hugely important. Um, the problem was that prior to HTML5, if you used ARIA in an HTML4 document or in an XHTML1 document, the document no longer passed the validators. 
using ARIA in conjunction with the earlier markup languages produced non-valid or non-conformant code. It was actually better for the users. It actually worked in all of the browsers. But if you had a mandate that said, all my pages must validate, you couldn't use ARIA because the moment you did, your pages wouldn't validate anymore. So there is, in fact, an author's version of HTML5 right here that is the ARIA version. And it actually talks about how you can completely integrate ARIA into your HTML5 markup. How many people in the room are actually starting to look at or are using HTML5 today? Show of hands. Cool, cool. So I, I really urge you to take a look at this particular specification. Um, it's very user friendly. It was written to be an author's guide. And um, it allows you to make accessible HTML5. So well, let's take a look at this a little bit. So in HTML5, as some of you may or may not know, we've, they took a look at the document structure. And one of the things they did is that they noticed that there was a common thing, this header element in a page layout. And they looked at like millions of web pages. And this was a reoccurring pattern. And what happened is that you would have a div with an ID of header. And so they decided, OK, well, we'll just create a new element called header. Makes perfect sense. We also had a div of ID nav, which you know, virtually every web page has a navigation block. So they created an element called nav. We also have um, the footer, which is a common structure. And then they created a couple of additional elements in HTML5, the article, the aside, the section. These are smaller blocks that normally sit inside of the main content right here. Surprisingly enough, they didn't actually declare a content container natively. So for many developers, they'll still be using a div. But this basic structure here um, is what's been baked into HTML5 today. And so now we have landmark elements in HTML5. But the question I'm going to ask you is, do you notice anything on this slide based on some of the stuff that I just talked about? And so the interesting thing is, if, if we actually look at code or HTML code, here's how you would mark up this particular page in actual code. And so now you've got a header, you've got a nav, you've got content and whatnot. But these are landmark roles as well. And so one of the things that I suggest is, and I was asking Denis earlier today if there's a French equivalent of the, there's an English expression called belt and suspenders, which basically means to be double safe. You, you really want to make sure your pants don't fall down. So not only do you have a belt, but you put on suspenders as well, right? So it's like you're being ultra, ultra safe. And so what I recommend to authors today when you're using HTML5 or as you're moving to HTML5 is to be both backwards and forwards compatible. Not only do you use the header, which is the new HTML5 element, but use the role of banner. They're the same thing. Not only do you have, oh, I added a new one here. We have a role of search. And so we don't actually have a search landmark element in HTML5, but this is not uncommon to have a div of, uh, with an ID of search. So give it the role of search as well. This piece of code contains the search box or the search query on a web page. We'll talk a little bit about forms later on. You also have the nav element. And in ARIA, we have the role of navigation. So by specifying both, we're being very, very clear. We're being forward compatible in HTML5. And we're also being backwards compatible. Because remember, and here's the real key thing, a lot of the um, browsers today still don't know how to interpret these new HTML5 landmark elements. And so what happens is that if you're using an older browser, it doesn't know what a nav element is, and so it defaults back to div. What's a nav? I don't know, but this looks like a div, so we'll call it a div. So by adding the roles that ARIA provides, you're providing your backwards compatibility. You've got a role of navigation. You've got a select. So many times we'll see in navigation a little drop-down box that would be used to actually um, navigate from page to page. So that's a menu. And we can actually specify menu using ARIA as well. You've got the div of ID content, which, uh, as I said, there was no landmark element in HTML5. But we have the role in ARIA. 
And then we have the different uh, uh, sort of smaller container elements inside of the content. Uh, the section, uh, section element has the same as group, so you can group multiple things together. Um, let me see, if you've got a Twitter feed on your web page, that would be appropriate to, to, to group in, in the section element because it's a collection of individual comments that are coming in. Um, an article is as an article would suggest. Uh, the aside is some complementary information. It's not it, it, it's related to the document, related to the main article, but it's a sidebar kind of thing. And then finally, of course, the footer, which has the role of content info. And so the way that ARIA sort of defines content info is this is where you put your uh, copyright notification, or for some of the federal government people here, this would you put your important notices, declaration, that kind of stuff. So. You know, to, to do accessible HTML5 today, if you're just doing actual documents, this is all you really need to do, right? This is your basic template of all of the landmark roles. This is your basic, basic layout template. And by marking it this way, using the HTML5 landmark elements, using the ARIA roles, landmark roles, you have now created a rich and robust landscape, as it were, that all of the accessibility APIs can pass on to the screen readers so that screen reader users know exactly where they are at all times. It's not that difficult, it's not that complicated, and what's really important is that if you start doing this today, all screen reader users, including those that are using older technology, are gonna be, for the most part, able to consume this. The landmark roles have been supported in screen readers for four, five, six years now, something like that, you know, depending on the different uh, screen reading technology. But we have really rich and robust and now long-standing support. So that's our document. Pretty simple, pretty basic. We also have something called states and properties. And so the, the difference between states and properties is... Um, it's not that complicated, and it's very, but it's also nuanced. Essentially, a state is something that's expected to be changing. And so we oftentimes we have through scripted interactions, whether it's a JavaScript or something like that, or even PHP or some of those server-side technologies, but you may change something on the fly. And so that's essentially what the state is considered, whereas properties are envisioned as sort of being something that's a little more static and is not going to change as much. And so we have 35 different states and properties. I've highlighted a couple here that we might want to take a look at. So for example, we have the ARIA checked, whoops, excuse me. We have the ARIA checked state. So um, many times you'll see a sign up page where um, down in the bottom in the small print it says, do you want our newsletter? And the checkbox is already checked off. But if we don't, I mean, screen readers now, they know to watch for these kinds of things, but it's not a very good um, user interaction. But if we specify that the box has already been checked off, that information is automatically conveyed to the screen reader user. So they don't inadvertently click on a checkbox and actually unselect the ability to receive your newsletter. It's really easy, you just add, you know, aria checked equals true. So all of these states and properties are Boolean selectors. They take a value of true or false. And if you don't specify them, then the native sort of uh, rendering is that it's false. Uh, Non-specified is the same as false. Um, but you need to have both, just so you can have true. Um, we have aria described by, which allows us to describe some information that may not be clear or may not be obvious. It can say this thing over here is described by this text over here. Aria described by right now is a little bit contentious. There's a little, little bit of confusion about what it can and cannot do. One of the things that you need to be really, really careful of, and this is something that some people are arguing is wrong, some others are arguing that it's right, but it's a, an, an issue that's started to surface recently. Denis mentioned that um, I'm very active in the long desk discussion, which we were not going to get into today. Um, but one of the things about ARIA described by is that it can point to text that's both on screen and off screen. But there's a problem in that when it's pointing to text 
on screen, it can point to rich marked up text. So you can have a span where you switch languages, you can have list markup, you could have a table, you can have any kind of structured HTML content. And as long as it's on screen and ARIA described by is pointing to that block, it'll be rendered to the screen readers as rich HTML text. But if you take something and you put it off screen using you know, many, any of the, the different sort of off screen techniques, ARIA described by must flatten it out to what they call string text or unstructured text. And the reason for this has everything to do with tab focus. You can't have something that's tabable that will take a tab focus that's off screen because it's going to interrupt with the user experience for a sighted user with mobility impairments. They're tabbing through, they see the focus and all of a sudden the focus disappeared because you're tabbing through a 14 bullet list item, uh, unordered list, that's completely off screen. And so the way the specification is written, if the content is off screen, it's flat text. Watch out for that one. Um, we also have ARIA label and ARIA labeled by. It's another way we know with forms that you need to label form inputs. And we have the label element, but ARIA label and ARIA labeled by essentially have the same kind of technology sort of mapping, again, back to the API. This is very useful when you're creating dynamic content. You can actually say this piece of dynamic content is labeled by that. We have ARIA read only. So we've seen on, on some websites where the terms of usage may in fact be put into a text box where you can sort of scroll through the text box and then you check at the bottom, I've read this, and submit. And so people use it almost like an, uh, an iframe, but it's, they're using the text input. So if you mark ARIA read only, then they can't tab in and start changing that. So a useful technique there. ARIA required, we're going to look at in a minute, but essentially this says that you know, this particular form input, for example, must be filled in before the form can be submitted. And then you've got ARIA selected, which again is a state. So if you have something that has been selected, we can convey that back to the Accessibility API. I have two here that I put with red boxes around because they can be problematic. And so the first one is ARIA hidden which is a state. And we all know that if you use the CSS property of a display none, that not only does it not display on screen, but um, screen reading technology will not pick it up as well. It's completely removed from the DOM. So you have to be careful when you use something like that. HTML5 introduces a new attribute called hidden. And ARIA, or ARIA also has ARIA hidden. But the, the important thing to understand is that when you use this, yeah, you're taking it off the screen, but you're taking it completely out of the page flow. And so be very, very careful because the impact that you have by using this particular attribute um, can be catastrophic if you don't do it right. The other one is ARIA multi-selectable. And I understand why they added it. We need to be able to convey that. But I strongly, strongly urge you against actually using this. What this is is that we have many times a select element, sort of the drop down. And you can, in fact, go in and select two or three or four of the choices in that drop down select. But that can be a real problem for people with mobility uh, impairments or visual impairments or even cognitive disabilities. And the problem is, is that your select may expose six or seven of the 15 choices. And if the first choice has been selected, then you scroll down, and you're not actually holding down the key so you can do the multiple select, you may in fact lose the one that's now off the viewport. And so it's a really, really awkward interaction model to use. I strongly urge you against doing it, but if you are, at least you can convey to the screen reader user that this is one of these really not very useful drop-down selects. Be careful because you can, in fact, select more than one choice here. So states and properties, I mean, some of them 
are very much related to scripted uh, actions. But the ones that I've highlighted here in yellow are something that regular web developers can and should start using today because they allow to convey additional information about your document. So I mentioned some of them are about, you know, are specific to forms. And the reality about HTML5 today, and it's something that goes back to almost 10 years now, the emergence of DHTML or Web 2.0 or AJAX, HTML5, it's all about the, the fact that users' um, interaction model with web content has changed. In the early days of the web, it was all about pushing documents to the user. Here's a document, read it. Here's a document, read it. But now it's all about interaction. Here's a widget, do something. Go online and book your train ticket. You know, go online and, and post a comment to Twitter. It's back and forth, it's interactivity. And the way that we interact with our users is by using forms. So whether you like coding forms or not, they're here and they're something that we do on a regular basis. So we need to take care to ensure that those tools, the interactive form elements that we're working with can be made accessible as well. So one of the cool things about HTML5 is that they've introduced a whole series of new form inputs. And I've again highlighted some here that I think are particularly useful and useful for very, people with various types of disabilities. One of the ones that I really, really like is input type of email, URL, and search, but mostly email and, and URL. And where we're seeing the real usefulness of that is again on the mobile devices. And if you specify that the input type is, for example, email, you'll notice on many of the smartphones that the keyboard actually changes and the at symbol button is now right there. And so I would suggest to you that putting that button front and center is a benefit for people with cognitive disabilities. They don't have to go looking for that symbol. It's right there on the main keyboard. And it's also useful for people with mobility impairments because it's right there. Again, they don't have to go searching for it. Same thing with URL. On many of the smartphones, it'll actually put a .com button down as part of the keyboard selects, right? Which again has the benefit of not having to type as many characters, which is difficult on the smaller interfaces. And it's a common button that people use. So you can use these today and they will provide benefits on certain platforms on certain circumstances. Here's the really cool thing about all of these new input types is if you're using a browser or if you're using a system that doesn't recognize what an input type of URL is, it defaults back to text. So again, this is robust. You can start using this today. The support is emerging. Surprisingly enough, the best support is on the mobile devices, but it's useful and it, it adds additional sort of semantic structure to your form. We also have a couple of other that I think were really useful. Placeholder, and I'll show you an actual cold example of placeholder in a minute, but that is sort of puts text into the text input area that lets people know that they're supposed to put something here. In the past, we used to sort of hack something together with JavaScript, and then when you put focus on the, the box, it was supposed to supposed to make that text disappear. But as I'm sure everybody in the room has experienced on at least one occasion, that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll put the cursor right in the middle of that, that word and it doesn't disappear and so then all of a sudden you get this really strange string of text. For non-sighted users, this was a disaster. So placeholder is very useful there. There's another one I've added here at the bottom. This is actually not part of ARIA. It's actually part of the HTML5 specification under the grouping of what's called content editable, but it's spell check. And spell check right now is really, really um, immature. It's an emerging kind of uh, part of the specification, but as you can imagine, is very useful. Again, I put this one here of autofocus. And autofocus is useful, it's cool, but there are some particular accessibility problems that 
come with using autofocus. So anybody that's done any kind of commercial web development, and I think a lot of the people in the room have, you know, their, their users say, this is what I want. This is the client wants this. And so one of the things that I hear time and time again is what, when it, say, for example, a search page loads up, that the focus is on the text input so they can start typing the query right away. And I can understand as a user interaction pattern that would be very, very useful. The problem is, <clears throat> Excuse me. For screen readers, you've skipped over everything that preceded that text input. And I'm going to show you an example of why that's a problem in a second. But autofocus is problematic. So, oh my, my formatting got all messed up. The problem with using HTML slides. So, um, here we go. You can see I'm using autofocus right here. The cursor is blinking and we're ready to go. But the form has an important information right here. Don't search for rainbows or unicorns because the website will explode. I had to come up with something. So um, I'm sorry that maybe, Denis, I don't know how to reduce the size of the text, but um, you'll have to forgive me here. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that this form is in fact marked up accessibly. So the very first thing we do is we put in the label for search, right? So now we have this programmatically associated to that. And I think anybody that's done any accessible web development up until today knows that this is Forms 101, that we need to provide the programmatic label. Okay? But as I move along, I've given it an ID of search. And that, of course, is so that the, the label markup will actually link the two together. But because my um, client insisted that I have the autofocus, I'm using the HTML5 autofocus attribute, which puts the cursor there. But then I used aria described by. So again, remember that aria described by can point to text elsewhere on the screen and say, here's a description, here's some contextual information about this widget. And today the widget is a search input box. It's a basic widget, but it's still in the lexicon, it's still a widget. And so what I've done here is by using aria described by, and I'm pointing to a value, that value is in fact associated with the ID. In the same way that label, the ID, and the, and the search are associated, aria described by is associated to the ID. So the net effect is that when this loads, the first thing the screen reader is going to know is that They've landed on a form input. It is, in fact, a search input. And the aria described by gives them the warning, searching for rainbows and unicorns will cause this website to explode. So now they know, before they even start typing, that very important advisory information that is in the source code before the form input that autofocus was skipping over. Basic, simple, aria described by works today. Autofocus works today. Add this to your toolbox today, please. Here's another one. And we've seen this so many times, right? Name, star, email, star. And if you actually sit with a screen reader user, you'll hear it all the time. Name, star, email, star. And, you know, for screen reader users, they've kind of learn to shrug and accept it, but it's not a great user experience. And so I would suggest to you there is, in fact, a better way of doing it. So the first thing I do is that I make a little bit of CSS here. And there's two things I want to point out. So first of all, I am using a background color because I believe that that's useful. You don't have to do it this way. But by, by putting the attention on these required inputs using CSS, um, you can actually sort of really bring it to the fore. Um, I've also used a background image of the asterisk. So this little thing right here is not actually text. It is, in fact, an image. And so what happens is that because it's as a background image, A, I'm not supplying alt text to it because you can't supply an alternative text to a background image, but B, it's no longer being voiced by the screen reader. 
Um, the other thing is that you'll notice I've put the form into a list. I'm not saying you have to do it, but I find it useful to put it as a list because it gives me some kind of formatting as opposed to putting in a table, which I highly recommend you don't. So then as we look at some code, the first thing we do is we make sure that the label is there, of course, and the ID. Okay. And then I've added the CSS to get this, this visual representation that it's required information. But again, the screen reader is not reading out any of this because it's just a visual representation. But then I've added the HTML5 attribute of required. So in the form inputs, when we looked at it, one of the attributes was required. Okay? The problem today is that not a lot of screen readers actually recognize the HTML5 required attribute. So I also add the ARIA attribute of ARIA required with a value of true. So now screen reader users also know that they have to provide this kind of information. And so then I can mark up the rest of my form. For required information, I use the combination. And for shoe size, which we don't care, I don't bother. Okay. Again, widely supported in the browsers today. Very, very useful. I mentioned that um, spell check was another attribute in forms. This, as I said, is very immature. It's just emerging. It only really works in uh, Chrome today, in the latest builds of Chrome. But Chrome being a WebKit browser, we'll probably start to see this in Safari next. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take before it's widespread. So while you can't rely on spell check today as a forward sort of thinking compatible kind of attribute, I urge you to do it for obvious reasons because I'm a lousy speller. So one of the things that I also wanted to talk about very, very briefly is the, uh, the ability to now use video in HTML5. Um, people that know me know that I've been very active in this space, so I thought I'd spend a couple minutes on that. Um, as we know, the ability to add video in HTML5 is one of the so-called flash killers. And it's going to be really, really useful. I'm, I'm very encouraged and excited about what it's going to bring to us. Um, the ability to actually insert a video into your web page without having to build or embed a media player is powerful. It means that the code is smaller, it's leaner, it's going to travel faster. And a lot of the things like the, the, the controls are built right into the browser. So it's going to be really, really cool. We, of course, have in HTML5 the codec problem. And I'm not going to go into details right now, but the way that you encode your video, um, they not been able to settle on an established standard. Uh, it has everything to do with patents. And you heard Michael Cooper talking earlier about how patent encumbrances can be a problem on the web. And this is one of the places where it's emerged. So there are a number of different codecs out there. If you're producing uh, video content, HTML5 video content, I suggest you do the first two. OGTR, I think, is probably going to disappear fairly quickly. So. The problem is that we don't have a lot of support for this right now. But one of the things that we did, and you know, I'm very active at the W3C, is that we sat down and we looked at what the requirements were for actually embedding media into a web page. And we basically came up with three lists. You know, we looked at the different types of disabilities. And so we actually sat down and said, how does a blind user interact with media on the web? How does a mobility impaired user interact with media on the web? How does a deaf person interact with media on the web? And so by actually focusing on user requirements, we're able to build up a, a list of content strategies on, OK, based on understanding what these needs are, these are the types of things that we need to provide. And so it's more than just providing closed captions. It's being able to ensure that the users can actually interact with the controls you know, using more than just a mouse. It means being able to stop and start or stretch out the time or compress the time so we can provide things like the script of audio, which explains to the non-sighted user the scene that's happening. So we spent a lot of time on that. Um, and if you're interested, the URL is there. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. So I, I could talk about this for hours. I could have done 45 minutes just on this, but we decided to do something else today. But we can follow up on that if you're interested. So um, the accessibility user requirements is, as Michael said, it's in a draft status right now. Um, I had put up the URL. And so um, one of the things that we can do um, as part of this draft status is we can now provide closed captioning using something called the track uh, element. 
It's a child element of the video that allows us to specify the various tracks of text, so closed captions, subtitles, and whatnot. We have three different types of timestamp format for this stuff. Um, again, a little bit of sort of uh, lack of harmony. We were, it would have been nice if we'd been able to settle on one timestamp format, but um, we weren't. And so like images, you've got PNG and JPEG and, and GIF. Well, for timestamp, we've got three different types. Um, we also have a means to do some basic rudimentary and perhaps um, complex content negotiation based on structure. So video on the web is going to be more than just, you know, the three-minute YouTube video. We may, in fact, have longer things. And uh, not only does this apply to video, but it also applies to audio. And the use case that, that most crystallized or brought this into focus was imagine putting the Bible as an audio track on the web where the Bible has chapter, verse, and passage. And so if you think about it, it's a hierarchical navigation. And so we wanted to be able to do that. And we have something called chapters that uh, we don't have any implementations right now, but we believe we'll be able to, to do that using the chapter um, attribute. We have a multi-track API that allows us to provide, for example, picture-in-picture -picture videos and how those are going to be synced together so we can provide uh, sign language translation. And the ability, to, as I said, to shorten or extend the timeline so that we can put in descriptive audio and whatnot. So all of this has been specified out, but it's not yet supported in any of the browsers. We don't have any native support yet. My belief is that we're going to start to see this over the next nine months to a year. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, anyway, so to, to use HTML5 video today, we have what's called polyfills. These are little JavaScript routines that you can embed into your web page that sort of fills in the gaps because we don't have the native support. Um, again, I mentioned this presentation is online, so if you're interested in any of this, um, I would suggest that any polyfill that supports web, web VTT and uh, SRT um, is probably your best bet. This one here is really good. DFXP is, is uh, the W3C XML sort of standard, so that one's a good one as well. We can tell the, the uh, user agent what kind of text transcript it is, and so maybe it's a subtitle, or maybe it's a caption, or maybe it's descriptions or chapters, which would be its own text track that describes that hierarchical navigation, or metadata. So we have a rich way of describing what the content actually is. And so I've done just a really quick little markup that shows you how HTML5 video would be marked up. So you have the video element. You can specify controls, which will use the native controls in the browser. Or for the really adventuresome, you can create your own using JavaScript. We have the source attribute that specifies the different encodings. And as I said today, because of the problem with the codings, you have to specify certainly the first two and ideally the three. And then here's the track attribute. You can label it. So here's English captions. The kind attribute says that these text files here represent captions. And I can also specify the source language, which in the province of Quebec, as we all know, is very important to be able to specify one or both. And then we have the different, this here is, is not yet in the spec, but we believe that we're going to have to be able to do this to be able to specify the different types of timestamp formats. So that's a basic sort of markup of how video is going to work in HTML5. Again, we don't have native support, but it's coming soon. Another one of the so-called flash killers is uh, Canvas. And it allows us to provide scripted kind of ability to move pixels around on the screen. Um, it's great for rendering graphics. Those people that are working in the gaming industry and gaming on the mobile device is apparently big business. Go figure. Um, the problem is, is that we cannot yet make Canvas accessible. We've got potential solutions that are coming along. The discussions have been very acrimonious. Um, it's going to be very, very complex. And, and seriously, if you need to have dynamic graphics and you want to make it accessible, my recommendation to you would be to avoid using Canvas and use SVG again. But we could have spent an hour on that today as well. So they're also splitting out uh, WebGL, which is going to be a means of providing three-dimensional graphics through scripting as well. Very, very cool, but it's not going to be part of HTML5, I don't think. And so 
that's it. Uh, Denis, we have some time for some questions, I guess. The presentation, as I said, is online there, and my contact information is there.